here is a summary of the book of Acts. Um, why is it called Acts? Um, it's often referred to in shorthand as the Acts of the Apostles. Um, but right at the beginning, um, Luke, who's written Acts, says that it's about what Jesus continued to do. So Luke wrote Luke's Gospel about what Jesus began to do, and Acts is about what Jesus continued to do. And so um, it's the Acts of Jesus through his apostles, those who were sent by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the big question, therefore, is what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? That's what we're, we're looking at today um, in the passage in the Bible um, that is printed on the inside of your sheets, um, if you have a look there. Um, we're going to be thinking about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. You see verse 4 of Acts chapter 2, which I'll read in a moment. But just have a look at verse, verse 4. It says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? And um, for any of you who have been around churches for a while, you'll probably know there's quite a lot of controversy over this subject. Um, there are people who, who debate um, whether um, we should expect to be filled with the Spirit today um, in the same way that they were back then. And what I want us to do is really just examine the text um, as I've been preparing, some of you know that I listen to a lot of uh, other talks as uh, a way of preparing as well as, as reading the passage and praying over it and reading commentaries and so on. What's so striking about um, a lot of them, and, and I suppose I'll have to do a little bit of it today, but I'm going to try and minimize on that, is, is how much they bring in from outside to say, this is what this is about. And really, I want us, at least in the first half of this sermon, to just be reading and letting the passage speak to us and I'll just be highlighting what's in there and the reason we have it printed out in front of you is so that you can double check that that's what I'm doing um, and what we've also been doing in our gospel communities is we've been reading the passage in advance so that you can be doubly what's called Berean uh, the Bereans are people who turn up later in Acts and they check even what the Apostle Paul said uh, was true from the scriptures um, and uh, they're commended for that they're told that they're, they're very honorable for that and so let's be honourable in the way that the Bereans are. And I want you to check as we go through this um, that what I'm saying it means to be filled with the Spirit is what the passage is saying, what God's Word is saying, and that it's his Holy Spirit speaking to us. Um, the first question is what was promised. So this is a kind of summary of what we've seen so far in Acts chapter 1. And you'll see there at the top of your sheet I've put a few verses uh, from Acts 1. Um, so we're going to just dive in, dive in there. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus, speaking to his 11 apostles, um, soon to be 12 again, um, we looked at that last week, says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then a few verses later he says, the same thing in different language. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, so Jesus said that they would be baptized with the Spirit or they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on them in order to be his witnesses. So the question is, what was promised? And the answer... And feel free to put your hand up if, and, and, and disagree with me if you think this is wrong. But I think the answer is that what was promised is the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, who will come on them to empower them for mission, what we call mission. That, actually, the word we get mission from is the same word as the word apostle. It means sent, to be sent to do the work that Jesus would have us do, to continue the acts of the Lord Jesus. Um, so what was promised the Holy Spirit, who will come on them to empower them for mission. Anyone want to ask a question at this point? Or are we agreed that that is what Jesus is promising them and asking them to wait for? Brilliant. Okay. Now, what do they do? Verse 14. They've received this promise, and as we were looking at last week, they don't just sit back and relax. They all joined together constantly in prayer. 
So the way God wants us to respond to his promises in his word is not to just let go and let God. I don't know if you ever heard that horrible phrase. But um, not just let go and let God, but actually um, to, be, uh, to be praying to him, to seek him earnestly, um, to, to wrestle in prayer as we were looking at in the Jacob series. And here they all join together constantly in prayer, doing what Jesus told them to do, to ask and keep on asking, to seek and keep on seeking, to knock and keep on knocking, knowing that their heavenly father loves to give good gifts in response to his children's prayers. Okay. So that's what was promised. Now, this is one of only two places in um, in the Bible. Can I grab some water? Thanks. Um, This is one of the only two places in the New Testament or in the whole of the Bible where baptism in the Spirit is talked about. And um, uh, I'm just going to do a little reminder of what we looked at in week one. What? What? Why does he call it baptism in the Spirit? Well we were reminded of what John the Baptist did. So when John the Baptist in Luke 3.16 talked about baptism, he said that uh, what he was only doing with water, he could only get people wet. Jesus was doing in reality in their hearts with the Holy Spirit. And then, shortly after that, Jesus turns up to be baptized. Not because he, like us, needed to die to sin, be buried and raised, but so that he could lead the way and show us what the result of Heart baptism is. And the two things that happen to Jesus as he comes up out of the water are, um, one, that he receives the voice of the Father. So the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove so that people can sort of visualize. Um, The Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove on, on Jesus. And then the voice of the Father comes, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So what Jesus receives as he comes up out of the water is assurance of sonship. Now, in one sense, nothing changed. Um, Jesus was, has been the eternal son of God um, since uh, eternity past. And then he took the name Jesus and humanity to himself when he was uh, conceived in the womb of Mary. And he was born as a baby. And, and nothing changed. He'd, he's always been the son of God. And um, in his humanity, he's always been a child of God. And... So nothing changed when his baptism happened, but what he received was huge assurance of sonship. And um, uh, as we looked at before, and we're going to think about a little bit uh, more today as well, um, that that there's a wonderful uh, picture of baptism in the spirit in that... um, uh, in in the example of a father and son who are walking down the street. Um, uh, Some ancient theologians... um, used this imagery, and, and many have picked it up since, of a father and son walking down the, the streets, just happily hand in hand, and then suddenly the father picks up his son and grabs him in his arms and hugs him and says, you are mine, you are precious to me, I love you so much, I just love doing life with you. And then he puts him down. And nothing's changed, except there's a massive spring in the son's step and an excitement and, and a kind of a power and, and we see that power then outworked as the Holy Spirit then leads Jesus into the wilderness to begin his three years of earthly ministry. And, um, and so two things happening at, at baptism. One is massive assurance of sonship. Uh, assurance that um, uh, we're a child of God, that he's a child of God. Um, assurance that he's special. Um, and then uh, an empowerment for mission. Uh, by the power of the Spirit. And from then on, we're told Jesus is led by the Spirit, praised by the Spirit, rejoices by the Spirit. Now, these uh, believers, these followers of Jesus in Acts 1, have all those, uh, th- those things th- in terms of the assurance of sonship. Uh, they know they're children of God. Uh, we know that they're, um, uh, the, using the language of Jesus, they're born again. Uh, Their hearts are alive. They've got soft hearts. They're they're regenerated. They're able to pray to their Heavenly Father, so much so that their prayers put us to shame, don't they? I mean, they look far more spirit-filled in that sense um, than we do. But yet Jesus has said, wait. And so these are children of God, deep relationship with him, able to live by the Spirit in terms of um, uh, prayer and ministering to one another and worshipping. In fact, we're told um, at the end of Luke's Gospel that they spent all their time worshipping God and praising God in the temple. Okay, so in terms of vibrant, gathered worship, they are, they've got everything. 
Accept, Jesus has said, wait for power. Wait for power. Um, and so, what was promised? The Holy Spirit will come on them to empower them for mission. Okay, that's what they're waiting for. These uh, wonderful uh, examples of, of, of um, Christian leadership are waiting for power. Okay, what happened? What happened? Oh, that, I put that on there as a reminder. One of our little uh, vision statements is um, uh, being shamelessly prayerful. And, and this is a reminder that if, if we want to be filled with the Spirit, then um, we need to have that hunger for God that, that shows itself in prayer, and not just individual prayer. Um, many of us will find individual prayer very hard. Um, but gather together prayer. Um, what we're going to see is when the Holy Spirit comes, they're, they're, they're together, they're gathered together, almost certainly praying at the time that the Holy Spirit comes. And um, this is a little advert for Friday evening, um, this Friday evening, the 18th of October. Um, the third Friday of every month, we have an informal prayer and worship evening um, in the studio at the back of our house. And this Friday, we've got a special guest called Stuart Robinson, um, who uh, was, is now retired, but is, was a missionary um, in Bangladesh and then a, a church leader in Australia and um, has seen great uh, moves of God through prayerful dependence on the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be speaking about um, kind of strategies in prayer, biblical strategies in prayer. So if you want to come and um, hear from uh, a modern-day missionary and to be prayed for and uh, encouraged and empowered, then please do come this Friday. Okay. Next point. What happened? What happened? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. There on your sheets. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So that's about 120 of them uh, gathered together praying. Pentecost, um, the word just comes from the word 50, pente, um, 50. Um, and it's 50 days or literally 49 days, seven, seven weeks um, after Passover. And um, it was the feast of the first fruits, or a bit like a kind of early harvest festival, when the, the first crops were appearing um, on the trees or in the fields. And they would take these first fruits and they would um, say, Lord, thank you that um, all that you have sown is now coming to fruition. And um, because this happened in June rather than in sort of March, April, um, often there were even more people coming into Jerusalem than came in on Passover. So the biggest official festival was Passover, um, which was when they celebrated the fact that the lamb had died instead of the people, and God, in, um, uh, in bringing judgment over Egypt, passed over his people, not because they were any better than the Egyptians, but because they were trusting in the sacrificial lamb. That obviously points to Christ. Jesus died at Passover. So Jesus was the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this date, Pentecost, is tied to that date. And it's the, it's the, the first fruits of the harvest. Now you can sort of imagine from that, we're not told exactly why, but why, would, why God would choose this day to send forth his spirit. That the fruit of the saving work of Jesus in his death and resurrection is going to start happening as the believers are empowered uh, for mission. Um, so uh, Jerusalem would have grown from about 100,000 to perhaps a million. Um, so just this heaving city, loads of people around. Um, these 120 are praying together in a room. And then verse 2. Suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. A sound like. When we get sort of divine phenomena um, of God working on earth in people's lives to bring about great transformation, um, it's very hard to, to describe it. If you, if you read the book of Revelation describing the future and the return of Jesus, there's lots of symbolism. It's a bit like this because it's almost impossible to describe. Well, here, it wasn't literally a violent wind came in and caused havoc. No, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. You might have picked up already in the language of um, today's meeting that... Um, you could read this as a sound like the breathing of a great breath or the sound like the stirring 
of a great spirit filled the whole house. And um, when the spirit came um, in the time of Ezekiel and made the dry bones live, um, we're told that the same language is used, that the, the, the blowing of this violent wind comes as the spirit fills the dry bones and gives them life in Ezekiel's vision. And then verse 3. Um, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So not literally fire, that would have hurt a lot. Um, um, but what's striking here is um, that the, the tongues of fire come down. And rather than this being like um, Moses, one man, one prophet, one leader, going and seeing God speak to him through the burning bush with fire that doesn't burn up the bush, here... The tongues of fire, the, the individual flames, come, and what does it say? Came to rest, um, so uh, verse 3, they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So the light and warmth of God's Holy Spirit breaks into the cold and dark, as it were, to bring illumination, to bring God's word, to bring God's power, and not just to the 12 apostles, Often um, church structures try and promote great leaders. Um, and so you end up with um, vicars and archdeacons and bishops and archbishops. And they go from being um, just normal to reverend to very reverend to right reverend to extremely reverend to extraordinarily and fantastically reverend. And um, you get these ranks. And, and well, if there was going to be a name for these apostles, they would be the most blooming, amazingly reverend people ever. And yet, they're just 12 among the 120. You can't get any more ordained in one sense than here. And each of them receives the ordination of the Holy Spirit. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. Each of them becomes like a burning bush with God's word implanted inside of them. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Um, and if you had your uh, Bibles open, you'd see the footnote, but I've just put that there. Um, or languages. Uh, so um, we don't use the, the term tongue to mean language so much now, but there's an old hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. And I used to think it meant, oh, if only I could have literally a thousand tongues flapping to sing, if I only had a thousand voices. It doesn't mean that. It means a thousand languages. Uh, oh, that I had a thousand languages to express, express the glory of God. Well, um, so here it's talking about other languages. We know that, actually. Um, because of the verses that come. So all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, do you notice it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit? It doesn't say they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, clearly, this is the fulfillment of what Jesus said when he said, wait to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But Luke uses the language here, filled, which is the same language as he, he uses again and again and again for empowerment, um, for mission. Well, we'll come back to that. So, yes, this is a kind of one-off, the coming of the Holy Spirit to empower all of God's people for witness. But it shows it's repeatable. In fact, we're going to see we need it to be repeated. Then we also see they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled from outside in. It's striking today, someone I was listening to this week pointed this out, that um, the language of where our problems come from has changed quite a lot over the last few decades, such that apparently in, um, uh, among counsellors and psychologists, people used to go to their counsellors and talk about all the problems that were within them that they needed help to be freed from. Whereas now, counsellors and psychologists talk about how people come and they say all the problems that are out there that are affecting them. Because what children are taught and what we're all taught, and you see it all the time, is you are special, you are wonderful, you are perfect. The power is within you to do whatever you like. Whatever you want to be, the power is in you. And you just need to find that power inside of yourself. Some of you are thinking of songs. Um, you need to find that power inside of yourself. And then, then you can fulfill all your potential that is in you. But do you know what that does? That just creates massive pride or insecurity 
For a few people who do actually manage to achieve everything they dream of, it creates massive pride. So I saw one motivational video as I was preparing for this of a guy who was sort of absolutely stacked and was achieving great things. And he was saying, you can be like this. But as I looked at it, I just felt really insecure. I'm like, however much I work out, I'm never going to look as good as you. And, um, uh, and so I sort of just started to resent him. And, and um, that's what this idea of you have the power within you comes from. It's, it's nonsense. We don't. We don't have the power within us to achieve anything. Um, by the very nature of getting to the top, there have to be a lot of people further down the ladder. Um, and so um, all it does is it creates this kind of pride and insecurity. But all religions say that. They say if you're good enough, then God will accept you, which also leads to pride and insecurity. Um, and, you know, I bring it into my own job. Uh, whereas a pastor of a church, I think I need to be the best. I need to be the greatest. I want people to write blogs about me, being the one who's had this amazing uh, explosive growth of his church and people from all over the world wanting to come and hear him because I want to be the best. Um, <laughs> and, and it creates this kind of pride and insecurity. And yet what we see here is that God, the Holy Spirit, comes from outside to those who are weak. And they really know they're weak, don't they? If you read back through the Gospels then even the most prominent among them, the apostles, well, they've gone from 12 to 11 because one of them totally betrayed Jesus and then killed himself. And the rest of them also betrayed Jesus and ran off. And, and they were weak and they were pathetic and they knew that they'd failed him and they knew they could do nothing. And in their realization that before a holy God, they could offer him nothing, the Lord Jesus died and rose. And he met with them and he said, I forgive you. And he, and he, he healed them and he restored them. It's a full relationship with himself. And then God, the Holy Spirit, comes from outside to the humble to give them power. And often we can test our humility by our prayerfulness. If we think we can do it on our own, then we'll get on with it without depending on our God. But what we see here is some very humble people who know they need the Lord. Well, the first impact of being filled with the Holy Spirit is, well, let's look again, verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. They began to speak. Um, Are these clear words or unclear words? What do we think? Clear. Clear. Why do we think they're clear? Because... Yeah, exactly. So the first thing that happens when they're filled with the Spirit is they begin to speak clear words that are understandable even to people who you wouldn't think would be able to understand them. Okay, so the first impact of being filled with the Spirit is speaking clear words of public declaration. Now, I'm not going to spend much time talking about the gift of tongues, but some of you, if you've been around churches, will know that this is a controversial subject. Um, And I think the controversy comes just by confusion with the fact that the Bible happily talks about two kinds of speaking in tongues. One is the one here, which is for public declaration. It's speaking a clear word to be understood by all who are listening. The other type turns up mostly in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 and is in almost every case in that situation not for public declaration, but for private devotion. That helps you to remember, PD, PD. Public declaration or private devotion. And when we confuse the two, that's when the controversy starts. So Paul says to those who, are, who speak in a sort of heavenly language that even they themselves don't understand, but it really helps them to connect with God in the same way that, that perhaps a toddler really is helped to connect with their parents. You know, like our little Eliza has only just started to speak intelligible language, but for the last... Um, 18 months, she's been speaking unintelligible language, but she's still desperate to talk to us, and we love to hear from her. And and that's like a sort of private devotion language. And we're encouraged to seek that gift of private speaking in tongues, but not to bring it into the gathering. Paul says um, in that passage, he says, I'd rather hear, um, what is it, five clear words than 10,000 in a tongue that no one understands. I.e., if you've got a prayer of private devotion of speaking in tongues... Brilliant. I wish that you would all speak in tongues, Paul says, but on your own, in private, unless you are confident that there's an interpretation. And so occasionally it's right for someone to speak a language that seems unintelligible, 
but if they're confident that an interpretation would be brought. So that's where the controversy of tongues comes. Here, there's no controversy. It's public declaration. Everyone understands. To who? To who are they speaking? Verse 5. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So here we are, filled with the Spirit, beginning speaking clear words to all nations. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Now, at the moment, this is still to, to Jewish people who are scattered all over after the, the exile. So there are Jews who live all over the known world, and they've come in to celebrate Pentecost, and um, they speak all kinds of different languages. Um, and then verse 6, when they heard this sound... A crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. What sound? I think often when I first read this, I thought it was the sound of the rushing wind. I, I don't think it was that at all. In fact, we're told explicitly what they heard. When they heard this sound, what's the sound? A crowd came together in bewilderment, verse 6, because each one heard their own language being spoken. The sound of their language being spoken by people who shouldn't have been able to speak it. They would be used to coming into Jerusalem and communicating in, in Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek, which was the international language. They certainly wouldn't expect to understand Galileans. And yet, what happens? Verse 7. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, um, those from Galilee were from up north. Now, I suppose... Um, uh, similar to here, if you're from way up north in some of the Scottish regions, um, even people who speak English might not necessarily understand you. A similar kind of attitude then. How on earth are we understanding this strange northern dialect? Um, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans, verse 8, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native, says language, literally dialect? And then verse 9, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages, our own tongues. So, filled with the Spirit, the believers are declaring the wonders of God, so that outsiders can understand. Do you see? That's what being filled with the Spirit seems to mean at this point. Then verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Now, one of the reasons that they'd be amazed and perplexed is, is this is the first time any of them would have heard worship, as in the wonders of God declared in their own language. Because for Jews scattered around, even in their synagogues scattered around, and certainly when they come into the temple, they would hear Hebrew, or at most Aramaic, which is a derivation of Hebrew. They would have never heard the wonders of God proclaimed in their own mother tongue. And so they're amazed. They're, they're full of wonder. Wow, how is it that the word of God is going out and the wonders of God are being proclaimed in our own mother tongue? Now, do you see the, the significance of this? All of them coming together, all those languages mentioned, they're described by Luke deliberately as kind of exaggeration of, of all nations. The point is there is no one language or culture anymore that is dominant. That... that um, and, and it is the belief of Christians throughout the ages that um, translations of the Hebrew and the Greek language are the word of God. When we read, when we were reading, we're reading the word of God by his spirit made intelligible to us. Whereas if you speak to a Muslim, um, if you get a translation of the Arabic Quran, they'll say, oh, that's not the word of God. It's just a translation. It's an interpretation. You need to be able to understand the Arabic to really commune with God because the heavenly language is Arabic. But God doesn't speak one language. No, all of them hear the word of God in their own mother tongue. There is no dominant culture, which is just wonderful. And, and if we end up as a, as a church trying to sort of dominate uh, with one culture, saying, well, we've always done it this way, therefore we're right. We need to be very careful. Um, and as you see the gospel spread across the world, um, there's huge diversity in language and culture. 
um, in Christianity in a way that in Islam, everything is constrained to a Middle Eastern culture. Okay. So they're amazed and perplexed. And then verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. So they're filled with the Spirit. They're speaking intelligible words, declaring the wonders of God, but some look at them and think, you look drunk. Well, thinking back to that little picture we used earlier of the father and the son, and the father picking up his son and hugging him in his arms and just declaring how special their relationship is. You could imagine that little boy looking a bit giddy with excitement, just of that massive reassurance. And actually, when you're able to say, if someone as all-powerful as the eternal God of the universe loves me enough to send his eternal son to come and die as a man, to pay the penalty for all the mess and sin in my heart, if he loves me that much and you allow that truth not just to be intellectual words but to go deep into your heart by the power of the Spirit, just the joy and the release is just amazing. And, and you start thinking, why am, I, why am I worried about all this minor stuff that's going on in my life when I've just been given an eternal perspective of an eternal relationship with my heavenly Father who is the God of the universe? And suddenly everything is changed. And in one sense, you would look like you were drunk because when people are drunk, they have a couple of things that aren't necessarily negative. One is a kind of joyful fearlessness. A joyful fearlessness. And the other is uh, no inhibitions. I suppose those two go together. When someone is drunk, they can often be shameless about the things that people around them should think they should be ashamed of. Shameless about things that people around them think they should be ashamed of. And often, that's right if they're drunk. But there can be that release of inhibitions, that openness, that, you know, you, you see it all the time in films and things, that in order to get information out of people, to get the real honest truth, they'll get them drunk. But unlike alcohol, the filling of the Holy Spirit does something very different because alcohol is uh, apparently medically known as a depressant. I don't have Penny Duckworth here. Um, and we think, oh, hang on a minute, it can't be a depressant. It makes me feel happy, not, not sad. No, it depresses your brain functions. Um, so alcohol depresses your brain functions. So the reason that people look happy when they're drunk is because they're stupid. <laughs> the reason people feel happy when they're drunk is because they're stupid. Their, their brain functions have been reduced. They forget all the things they're worried about, and they walk away, sort of walk around obliviously happy. And then reality kicks in when they sober up. The Holy Spirit comes and he increases our sense of reality and control. We're more aware of what really matters. We're more aware of reality, more aware of God's love, that we are his children. And so the things that bother you don't really bother you that much anymore. Suddenly you've got an immense sense of security and all the things you're insecure about and worried about will have come under the control of your Heavenly Father, and you can hand them over to him and know, I'm, I'm just like a toddler walking down the street with the most powerful being in the universe. Why am I worried and fretting about those things? And why am I investing all my time and my energy in, in that career advancement or pursuing that relationship, none of which are going to last, rather than focusing on the one relationship that really matters, of the God of the universe who came down to rescue me? And you know, as I was preparing this, I was praising God for the vision statement that he gave to this church, really through John Stidwell, um, uh, who was one of the founding elders of this church. And this is the vision statement of our church, shamelessly pursuing fullness of life in Christ in Streatham. And, and often when I look at that, and I don't know if you look at that, you think, am I shamelessly pursuing fullness of life in Christ? I think I'm a little bit half-hearted. It just seems too strong. It seems too big. It is far too big a vision, isn't it? So what do we need? We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So under the heading, what happened? The Holy Spirit, so correct me if I'm wrong, listen carefully to this bit and see if you agree with me. The Holy Spirit filled them so that they could speak or declare the wonders of God shamelessly to every nation. Do you want me to say that again? The Holy Spirit filled them so that they could speak or declare the wonders of God shamelessly to every nation. Not, not in Hebrew, but in everyone's own language. And they had all their inhibitions removed, and they were made more aware of reality, not less. So much so that they looked like, in one sense, they were drunk. Well, third point. How did Peter, Peter explain what happened? Because it's all very well me observing that in the text. But unless the Apostle Peter, when he explains what happens, backs it up, then you need to ditch it. So verse 14 on your sheets. Then Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. They're asking the question, what's going on? They're all speaking the wonders of God in our own language. They're looking a bit drunk. Peter says, let me explain this to you. Then he says, listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Weatherspoons hasn't even opened the bar yet. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This, this people going out, declaring the wonders of God in every language. Verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit. So this is a quote from an Old Testament prophet, Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, or literally slaves, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So what's going to happen in the last days that they are observing? They're going to observe that male and female, that's sons and daughters, uh, young and old, so it says young men and old men, but actually it could literally be translated youths and elders, so young and old. So male and female, sons and daughters, young and old, servants, or if we see it as slaves, slaves and free, so even slaves, doesn't matter their, so it doesn't matter their gender, it doesn't matter their age, and it doesn't matter their social status. I will pour out my spirit, verse 18, in those days, and they will prophesy. They will prophesy. Well, what are these people doing then? Peter explains. They're declaring the wonders of God in words that others can understand. What does Peter call that? He calls it prophecy. Declaring the wonders of God in words that others can understand, the prophet Joel and Peter, in the inspired word of God, calls it prophecy. So we need to allow the Bible to de define our view of prophecy, not to think prophecy just means prediction of what's going to happen next. Okay? Prophecy means declaring the wonders of God or the word of God in words that others can understand. Then Joel moves on to describe the day of the Lord. Jesus used very similar language to verses 19 and 20. So have a look here. Verse 19. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Now, a lot of Joel's prophecy is all about the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, as in the final coming when he will bring in judgment on uh, all nations and will save those who are trusting in God. So he, he looks forward to the final day using similar language that Jesus used about when he will return to wrap up history. And then he says, verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Joel uses this phrase, the last days. So that is a phrase that then is picked up by New Testament writers. Everything that happened between Jesus' death, resurrection, and his ascension and when Jesus returns, in those last days, everyone, male, female, young, old, slave, free, will prophesy, empowered by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit. And everyone in that time who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And if you're in any doubt that that's what prophecy is, is that's what the fulfillment of this, these words from the prophet Joel are about, then listen to Peter teach about Jesus. Do you see the next verse on your sheets? Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22. And then he starts explaining about Jesus' earthly life and how he died and rose again. And then he ends his sermon there at the bottom of your sheets. We're going to look at that sermon in detail next week. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. See, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, that's Yahweh, that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is God, and Jesus has risen to rule. He is God reigning. He's the Messiah who's come to rescue people. And what happens as Peter preaches, as he prophesies in this way, verse 37? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So this failure, Peter, who'd betrayed his Lord in his time of greatest need, is now filled with the Spirit and prophesies about Jesus, which led to more people calling on the name of the Lord. So just by way of summary, how did Peter explain what happened? He said, let me explain this to you, the, everyone declaring the wonders of God in words that everyone can understand. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, really strikingly, isn't it? They're speaking in other languages, but in the prophecy from Joel, there's no mention of other languages. It's prophecy that's mentioned. Intelligible speech. It doesn't matter whether it's in other languages or not. Prophecy is intelligible speech that encourages people to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And everyone's going to be doing it. Empowered by the Spirit. Then Peter starts speaking about Jesus, his death, resurrection, and lordship. The people are cut to the heart. They repent. They're baptized. They receive the gift of the Holy Spirit themselves. And they too become small w witnesses. I want to allow time for us to respond. So I'm just going to keep going there. Unless anyone's got a burning question that they think would be helpful for everyone to hear. I know that puts a lot of pressure on, but please do feel free to, to ask a question of clarification at that point. Go on, Carl. So, God the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us new birth in the very first place. And that's what hap is happening when these people are cut to the heart and they respond to the gospel. So, Peter is empowered by the Spirit to speak in a way that the people all understand. And we're told that 3,000 of them respond. And they receive the Holy Spirit in the sense of um, being adopted as God's children, being added to the church. But... Both Peter and they will need to go on being filled by the Spirit to be empowered for mission. Okay, so, and that leads on really well to our last question on the sheet. What should we expect? We should expect, in accordance with Acts 1.8 at the top of your sheets, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We should expect that we too will be empowered. We will receive power. Because Jesus promised that to the first disciples and apostles. But the ends of the earth haven't been fully reached yet. And so that must mean that although we're not capital W witnesses, we are small w witnesses. And so if we have received this promise because the ends of the earth haven't been reached yet and we as Jesus' followers are there to reach the ends of the earth, then we must pray expectantly and dependently. And so as we draw to a close, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? 
answer, shameless in mission. Now, for those of you who know, uh, under our vision statement, shamelessly pursuing fullness of life in Christ, we have three statements, shameless in worship, shameless in community, and shameless in mission, which summarize the sort of biblical view of the church. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It means, from this passage, shameless in mission. And in fact, even in the passage we looked at right at the beginning of the service, on the, on the front of your sheets, do not get drunk on wine. Do you see the link there? But it, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking. See? Now, if we learn and depend on God to speak through us in the gathering then as we go out, we'll just be bubbling over with worship. You see, our worship forms our community, which then sends us out in mission. But it's it's possible to just get on with being Christians in a private life and not wait on the Holy Spirit, not depend on the Holy Spirit to come and fill us and empower us for mission. Now, we may later on bring in a a one-off talk on who the Holy Spirit is in sort of a much bigger view, because we're getting quite a narrow view here. But I just want you to to turn over the page and look at the back and see a couple of little verses that help us. So when Jesus, um, before he died, was teaching the apostles in the upper room in John chapter 16, he said this about the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit will glorify me because it is from me that he, he's not an it, he's a he, Because it's from me, he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me and he will make known to you. Father, Son and Holy Spirit working together. The Father sends the Son to die and rise again. The Son and the Father together send the Holy Spirit to empower the church. And the way that the Holy Spirit, you know if you're Holy Spirit empowered, is if you're glorifying Jesus. Do you see Revelation 19.10? The spirit of prophecy bears testimony. Literally, it's the same word. You will be my witnesses. Same Greek word. Bears testimony or witness to Jesus. So how do I know if I'm spirit-filled? I just can't stop talking about Jesus. You know, Jesus said it himself, that, that the good soil, in the parable of the sower, sows the seed, which is the word. You know that the seed has landed on good soil, when that soil produces a crop 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. The thing that was sown was the word, the word about Jesus, the message of the kingdom about Jesus. You know if you're spirit-filled if you just can't stop talking about Jesus, which means I'm imagining that a lot of us are feeling pretty ashamed right now. And hopefully we're feeling like those disciples felt after they'd let Jesus down. Lord Jesus, I desperately need to be empowered. I know you're the most important being in the universe, but I live as if my job is the most important thing, or as if my family is the most important thing, or as if that need for a relationship is the most important thing, or if the need to make more money is the most important thing. And I'm so, so sorry, because you are the most important thing, and I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit and empowered to declare the wonders of God about you. So the question is, do you want to be? Do you want to be shameless in mission? Do you want to be empowered? Yes. Thank you. I think different ones of us will be in different stages than that. Some of us will be still trying to work out whether Jesus really is who he said he was. And that's okay. That is great. That is fantastic. But his claims are so massive that once we've trusted in him, then he is the one who fills the universe and must fill our minds and our hearts. And we need the Holy Spirit to make us in one sense drunk, to take away our inhibitions so that we speak out for him.